Ah, nothing like a little holiday music to set the tone. Honestly, it's nothing more than a ploy to get your attention about the topic of our DIA Connections podcast called The Arctic. Let's face it, for most of us, maybe the only time the Arctic pops into our thoughts is when we think about the North Pole. And the only time we think about the North Pole is probably when we watch Elf. But that's not the case anymore. Things have changed. This is DIA Connections. I believe that along with space, the Arctic domain is going to be the center of global competition for the, for the rest of the 21st century. From a military perspective, the Arctic has arisen as a major source of concern in a climate change era because it's one area of the world where the impact of climate change is inescapable. Each piece of ice is the size of a a freight train or a school bus compacted together that will crush a 110 foot, 120 foot steel boat with a half inch plate steel into a pop can. We need as a nation to devote time and energy to better secure this region aligned to our interests and in concert with the interests of our allies and partners. We need to start catching up. Just a few of the voices we'll hear from about a very cold place, which has become a very hot topic. Welcome to DIA Connections and our episode, The Arctic. The Arctic is one of the most dynamic physical environments on the planet. Each year, more and more sea ice melts and more of the Arctic is being exposed. Conditions remain brutally harsh but warmer weather is creating more access, challenges, and threats. Here's what former Defense Secretary Jim Mattis said in 2018. Quote, Certainly America has got to up its game in the Arctic. There's no doubt about that. The reality is that we're going to have to deal with the developing Arctic, and it is developing. End quote. Development brings increased human activity with significant economic and security implications to the United States, and the security of our country is mission essential for the Defense Intelligence Agency. So we gathered up a team of people to provide unique perspectives for a discussion about the Arctic boom. First up is a retired career intelligence officer from right here at the Defense Intelligence Agency, Jim Denoy. Jim spent 37 years in the intelligence community in a variety of fields, including geospatial intelligence, current intelligence, crisis intelligence, policy support, and foreign intelligence relationships. I'm going to mention a few of his assignments, but trust me, there's more. They've included the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, the Office of the Secretary of Defense, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, U.S. European Command, NATO, the FBI, and the White House. And by the way, the White House assignment was as President Obama's presidential daily briefer. Spoiler alert, that sounds like it has the makings of a DIA Connections podcast all on its own. These days, Jim is a visiting fellow at George Mason University's National Security Institute. He is also the author of a policy paper titled The Arctic, Securing the High Ground. That's where we'll begin our discussion about the Arctic. Here's Jim Denoy and DIA historian Paul Isaacson. Jim, thank you so much for joining us today. Let's just jump right in. Can you give our listeners uh, just a quick geography overview of what the Arctic region sort of is or looks like? The Arctic region is, is typically defined as the land and sea area located within the Arctic Circle and uh, the latitude at about 66.34 degrees north, which encompasses a third of the landmass of the state of Alaska. You know, eight countries have territory within the Arctic Circle. You've got Canada, you've got Denmark by virtue of its uh, sovereignty over Greenland. You have Finland, you have Sweden, you have Norway, you have Canada, the United States, and Russia. So you've got uh, a number of of countries that have territory within that, that designated area. I believe that along with space, the Arctic domain is going to be the center of global competition for the, for the rest of the 21st century. A lot of people don't know that the United States is an Arctic state by virtue of Alaska. And so we have a vested interest in how that region develops 
as the region opens up with the shrinking of the polar ice cap and we see an increase in human activity. We need to educate the American public on really what's at stake up there in the high north. Let's talk a little bit about why the uh, kind of how you got involved on the uh, in the Arctic region and why it's important. One of your many positions at DIA focused on the Arctic. Uh, and can you tell us a little bit about what you did there and why is this an interest for the Defense Intelligence Agency? For those of you not familiar with DIA, DIA has these positions called Defense Intelligence Officers, and they are the chief substantive experts in their particular functional area or region. So I was the Defense Intelligence Officer for Europe and NATO. And, and you might say to yourself, well, what does that have to do with the Arctic? Well, five of the eight Arctic nations are in NATO. So invariably, NATO itself has an inherent uh, vested interest in the Arctic. And a number of years ago, when I was the Defense Intelligence Officer for Europe and NATO, we were constructing the first ever strategic research plan. And that plan laid out what the priorities were for that area of responsibility. And one area we were looking at were emerging issues, those issues that were going to be uh, become more important over the coming years. Now, this was more than 10 years ago. And those of us that were working on that problem set saw that uh, the Arctic itself was going to become more and more of an emerging security issue as, again, human activity was going to increase with the shrinking of the polar ice cap. Later on, I became the national intelligence manager for Europe and NATO at the office of the director of national intelligence, and I was able to carry forth that, uh, that focus. And that's, that sort of led me to the interest in the Arctic. DIA has a global presence, obviously, and DIA is responsible for understanding issues anywhere on the globe. And so naturally, that has to include the Arctic. That's correct. Uh, many people don't know that, uh, well, one, the Arctic is at the top of the world. And when you're looking at military and security issues, going all the way back to Sun Tzu, uh, the key to success is to secure the high ground. And there's no more higher ground on the planet than the Arctic. Uh, the Arctic also constitutes about 5% of the world's surface. That's about the uh, size of the African continent. So it is a big area and it is of strategic importance. We'll hear more from Jim later, but I'll tell you that he continually stressed the importance of increasing public awareness about the region. So with that in mind, Jim suggested that we speak with Randy Key, and we did. Randy is the executive director of, and this is fitting, the Arctic Domain Awareness Center. The ADAC in Anchorage, Alaska, partners with the University of Alaska and the U.S. Coast Guard. They're also part of the Department of Homeland Security Center of Excellence. Randy, thanks for joining us. Let me begin by asking you a very basic question. Why should Americans know or care about the Arctic region? Why do we care about the Arctic? What's in the Arctic that should be of concern to us? Part of the problem is a misunderstanding of the value of the Arctic to the average citizen of our country. This is now a, a new ocean available for maritime transport. As the Arctic continues to warm, you're trying to understand that the ice is diminishing and therefore it enables for both folks to have good intent and malign intent to come into areas that previously was just too difficult for most to access. Can you give us an idea of what is happening with regards to temperature there? So you're seeing an Arctic environment that is warming at twice the rates of lower latitudes. You're seeing a diminished ice pack that continues uh, continues year after year, a downward trajectory that's really started in earnest in 1979, 1980. And Randy, can you explain why that has had such a devastating effect? The problem is, is that, you know, a warm Arctic means, uh, a, a, an ice-free Arctic means a much warmer planet. So areas that are across the globe, you know, what goes on in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. A warming Arctic, of course, infects the rest of the planet, for certainly the rest of the Northern Hemisphere. It's not just about the sea ice, but it's also the physical changing aspects of the, of the rest of the Arctic environment. It was here last Saturday. Residents say they recorded the hottest temperature ever for the Arctic. Right now, Siberia on the, on the Russian Arctic 
is, exper- is, is experiencing some of the warmest temperatures ever recorded in Siberia. The heat wave has lit a match to the Arctic. One of the world's coldest regions is witnessing a record number of wildfires. They're also seeing extensive amount of forest fires in a region that historically have had forest fires, but the, the intensity and the scope of them are dramatically increased. One of the core missions of the Arctic Domain Awareness Center is to support the public good by responding to the challenges in the dynamic Arctic environment. Randy explained how this is of paramount importance to him. The Arctic is a fragile region, and I think that uh, environmental practices are are critical. we got to do it best as a global community in the Arctic region because the area is so fragile and is so important to do, you know, to get it right. We can't afford to get it wrong. Let me ask you about China. Over the past several years, they've taken on an aggressive diplomatic and economic effort to establish themselves in the region. And they aren't even in the Arctic Circle. In January 2018, they published China's Arctic policy, declaring itself a near-Arctic state. What does that mean? They're not an Arctic nation. They made the declaration that they're a near-Arctic state. I do do not know what that means. I've seen the, the... the environmental damage that they have done in the South China Sea and it, their, their, their practices there have actually caused environmental harm. The South China Sea is an example of, of actually taking environmental practices and, and turning them into environmental malpractice. So I just look at the example and it's clear for the world to see and the world can take their own conclusions, but I can't, I will not be able to find an environmental scientist to be able to look at what China has done in the South China Sea and say, yeah, that's a good practice. We should replicate it elsewhere. After a short break, we'll continue our discussion about China and their efforts to be a presence in the region. And later on, you'll hear our discussion with Jake Anderson. You might be more familiar with his name if I called him Captain Jake the Crab King. You'll hear why we're glad we spoke to him. He's a good catch. This is DIA Connections. Freedom, diversity, equality, democracy, prosperity, community, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Principles that are the heart of our country. Principles that the Defense Intelligence Agency is committed to safeguarding. Breaking new details about North Korea's missile launch. Russia test firing its new intercontinental ballistic missile nicknamed Satan-2. The international situation is the most complex and demanding that I have seen in all my years of service. We have taken an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic. We speak truth to power and safeguard the information with which we have been entrusted. We do this to protect the freedoms of all Americans, our allies, and future generations around the world, committed to excellence in defense of the nation, D.I.A. Welcome back to D.I.A. Connections. Despite the Arctic being called the wild, wild north, agreements between countries do exist. With that said, there's no overarching international legal framework for the Arctic such as the one that exists for Antarctica. And there are certainly no shortages of disputes. In fact, the United States and Canada have been in a tussle over Canadian territorial claims over one of the two major sea routes in the Arctic Circle, the coastal waters far above Canada's northern coast, the Northwest Passage. But the sense is that along with Russia, it's China's Arctic aspirations that pose a threat Jim Denoy writes, Chinese presence is likely to come at the expense of U.S. long-standing relations with European and NATO partners. Here again is DIA historian Paul Isaacson with former DIA intelligence officer Jim Denoy. Jim, China has come onto the scene as someone who is wanting to be a player in the Arctic region. How is that even possible? They're, they're not in the Arctic, Correct. I like to call China the Arctic wannabe. Uh, Consistent with its growing status as a global power and its economic policies, China wants to play a clear 
an important role in Arctic matters. They've declared themselves a near Arctic state, which frankly I find an interesting kind of designation. Probably the closest point of China to the Arctic is about a thousand miles, and、uh, as I like to say, that's that's like New York declaring itself a near Midwestern town. Right. Yeah, a thousand miles. For gosh sakes, I mean that's a long distance. China's introduction in the Arctic has the potential to kind of disrupt the Arctic、uh, equilibrium that we have become accustomed to、uh, amongst the the eight Arctic nations. So China brings with itself the potential to do a lot of economic development. Not all of it may be in the interests of. United States and our our allies, Jim. The United States has understandably been fairly focused after 9/11 on terrorism and other parts of the world. How has that played into perhaps our lack of action or focus on the Arctic in the last 20 years? Well, Paul, that's a great point, and that's absolutely spot on. For、uh, for a number of years, for almost an entire decade, both Russia and China were focused on the Arctic. We were.、Uh, Preoccupied, justifiably so, with prosecuting the global war on terrorism. So you had a situation where, again, after 9/11, we were focused on counterterrorism. In the meantime, Russia, particularly under Putin, who came into power in the year 2000, was focused on the development of the Arctic.、Uh, that is a significant issue because the Arctic for Russia has been a, a long-term、uh, goal of being the predominant. Arctic power, Jim. With all the issues going around around the globe, was there any specific event or something that really piqued your interest in the Arctic specifically? There was one one event that I think it was a wake up call for for everybody, and particularly the security community. And that was in two thousand seven, August second of two thousand seven, when Russia sent a couple of mini submarines to the bottom of the Lomonosov Ridge. In the Arctic seabed, and planted the Russian flag. This was a public event that was designed to shape the strategic narrative that that said that Russia is, and will be, and will remain the strategic dominant player in the Arctic. That's incredible. I mean, I, I find myself thinking it's equivalent to the United States planting a flag on the moon. Well, I think that was that was certainly the goal of Putin. And、uh, again, the Russians want to control the narrative relative to the Arctic. They are, by sheer landmass, the predominant nation in the region. Russia has the largest Arctic coastline of any country on Earth, stretching over thirteen thousand miles. Along the Arctic Ocean, from Norway to the west to the Sea of Okhotsk in the far east, has Russia more than any country have they seized the opportunity to be the dominant nation in that region? If you want to look to see where Russia is going, you you needn't go any further than look at their Arctic strategies. They're very clear in terms of what they want to do in that region, specifically focused on the the Northern Sea Route. This is the Channel of water that borders、uh, Russia's、uh, northern border through through the Arctic. They view that as、uh, essentially what they call kind of the main thoroughfare for for commerce. Neither the United States or Russia or our allies want the Arctic to become an area of confrontation and conflict. But here is the reality. Russia is an Arctic nation. Russia is the largest、uh, Arctic nation by by size. We're we're going to have to develop some kind of approach and strategy to deal with Russia when it comes to the Arctic. Of that, there should be no doubt. In 2019. The worldwide threat assessment prepared by the Director of National Intelligence highlighted climate change as a threat to what's called human security in a list that includes terrorism, cyber crimes, and weapons of mass destruction. Among the places it cites as being of particular concern is the Arctic, where receding sea ice may increase competition, particularly with Russia and China, over access to sea routes and natural resources. 
This leads the conversation we had with author Michael Clare. His new book has a chapter called The Melting Arctic and Other Conflict Zones. My book, All Hell Breaking Loose, is an attempt to demonstrate uh, how people in the U.S. military have thought about the impacts of climate change on what they do, essentially, on how it will impact their functioning in a world that's going to be severely disrupted by the effects of climate change. Claire writes that as the ice recedes, the Arctic could prove to be the first region of the world in which climate change plays a direct role in provoking conflict among the major players. A major issue at stake is the area's wealth of resources. The melting of the ice cap makes it possible to drill for oil and natural gas in the Arctic region. And it turns out that there is large, there are large reserves of oil and natural gas in this region that were previously inaccessible. But now because of climate change and the melting of the ice cap, it's becoming increasingly possible to exploit those reserves. So all of the countries around the region want to, to begin exploiting those reserves. And there are disputes between them over where the boundaries lie in the Arctic region between these various countries. The Arctic is at the forefront of opportunity and abundance. This That's United country. States Secretary of State Mike Pompeo in May of 2019 when he addressed the Arctic Council of paramount concern was the risk of increased competition and conflict over the area's valuable resources and trade routes. It houses 13 percent of the world's undiscovered oil, 30 percent of its undiscovered gas, and an abundance of uranium, rare earth minerals, gold, diamonds, and millions of square miles of untapped resources. As the ice melts and technology improves, resources will be more easily extracted, and Russia has been the country that has been the most assertive. Russia's main source of government income is the sale of oil and natural gas to Europe, to Asia, to wherever it can find clients. And until now, most of that oil and gas has come from oil fields below the Arctic Circle. But those reserves are running out. They're being depleted. And so Russia is increasingly turning to its reserves above the Arctic Circle to supply the future of its oil and gas requirements. And that means that that area now holds extreme geopolitical significance and economic significance to Russia. Russia is already leaving snow prints in the form of army boots. Russia formally announced its intent to increase its military presence in the region in 2014 when it reopened a Cold War Arctic military base. Under Vladimir Putin, Russia is making a, a huge attempt to improve its ability to operate in the Arctic. And with that has come uh, increased expenditure on military facilities in the Arctic region. So Russia is building up its military capabilities there. Claire writes about cold response, the name for NATO military maneuvers that take place every two years in the northern region. The goal of this exercise is to train steel-on-steel -steel activities, in other words, national warfare. The exercise is intended to enhance the fighting skills of combat units in Norway's Arctic environment. The mock aggressor force is Russia. The United States has been concerned about this, the Russian buildup for quite some time and has been building up a capacity to fight in this area, largely in conjunction with its NATO allies. So uh, its NATO allies are also alarmed by these developments, especially Norway and Iceland. And for the U.S. military, which never had to concern itself with the Arctic much before, suddenly this is now a region that has acquired geopolitical significance that it didn't have because of climate change. The whole new ocean that's emerged in the Arctic has created more challenges for the United States Coast Guard. And no one knows that as well as someone who completed a 27-year active-duty Coast Guard career. Here's Phil Thorne. 
there is a lot more traffic now in Arctic waters than there was 10 and 20 years ago. Those vessels are very wide ranging. You know, one thing that has grown greatly in recent years is tourism. The decreasing ice cover has encouraged uh, what we call adventurers or just um, everyday people with um, different types of small vessels to attempt to transit the Northwest Passage or to operate in the Arctic. Phil is now a U.S. Coast Guard Arctic Program Specialist in District 17 out of Juneau, Alaska. The 17th district encompasses over 3,853,500 square miles and over 47,300 miles of shoreline throughout Alaska and the Arctic. Phil coordinates Coast Guard activities across the Arctic domain and advises the district commander, staff, and field units on international and domestic Arctic matters. Phil, can you give us a better idea of how long the Coast Guard has been in the region and have your missions changed in recent years? The Coast Guard has been delivering services to Alaskans since 1867, when the U.S. bought Alaska from Russia. And we've been present uh, in the Arctic, in the Bering Sea, and other places in Alaska ever since then. The missions that the Coast Guard is performing in the U.S. Arctic uh, have not changed for decades and decades. You know, what has changed is the amount of work that we have to do and because the environment has changed and the waters have opened there is more traffic there is different types of traffic there are different needs of waterway users that didn't exist when it was frozen for almost all of the year we see the patterns of use by residents and other waterway users changing and we've had to change and adapt along with those that changing demand signal for our work. Phil, I'm hearing a lot about ships called icebreakers. They must be pretty important because in 2019, Congress approved allocation of $650 million for the construction of the first heavy icebreaker. That's supposed to begin in 2021 with delivery three years later. Tell us about them. So the Coast Guard has icebreakers, vessels that we call icebreakers, Uh, that are able to work in an environment where their ice, break ice, and perform missions in an area that most ships can't, you know, can't go. Former DIA intelligence officer Jim Denoy's policy paper, Securing the High Ground, states that a critical limiting factor for the U.S. in projecting a continued presence in the Arctic is an acute shortage of polar icebreakers. Do you agree with Jim? We need to be able to project our presence in the region and protect our sovereign interests and resources. You know, if you're an Arctic nation and you're a sovereign power, you need to be able to project that presence. In that way, presence equals influence. You know, right now, at the strategic level and the security level, you know, the United States is unable to project consistently the presence in our Arctic waters. And that's due to the fact that we have only two icebreakers In contrast, uh, a country like Russia has over 40 operational icebreakers uh, and is building icebreakers at a rapid pace to support, you know, their own Arctic interests. Additionally, China, although it is far from the from the Arctic, has interests in the Arctic, their own interests in the Arctic, and they have been building, they have built icebreakers to a greater number than we have and are building more. I think the The United States has recognized that, and there's been a lot of positive movement in recapitalizing our icebreaker fleet for the United States here in recent years, and that continues. Phil went on to tell us that the decrease in ice cover has led to an increase of extreme and unpredictable winds and currents. It makes operating in the Arctic very difficult and dangerous for the Coast Guard. It's also quite dangerous for our next guest. The most amazing thing about the Coast Guard is they come in where we end, if that makes any sense. We take it as far as we can possibly go with fishing and the waves. 6004 from the 1714, over. The Coast Guard rescue happening right now. And then when we mess up, here comes the Coast Guard with smiling faces and bravery and courage and honor 
to come and clean up the messes that we've gotten ourselves into. If that voice sounds familiar, then you know Jake Anderson. And you must be a fan of the popular television show about the dangerous work of crab fishing in the Bering Sea. I never thought I would become a deck boss, let alone a hook man, let alone an engineer. Now I'm an owner. And it's awesome. He's featured on the wildly successful and long-running television series, Deadliest Catch. After 21 years of fishing, from Greenhorn to the helm, Captain Jake Anderson finally pilots the saga as master and commander. The show documents the dangers of being on a boat in the Bering Sea in the midst of some of the coldest and stormiest waters on Earth. Watch out, you guys. Watching is a wild adventure. Hold on, you guys. Hold on. Damn! What the f***? What am I supposed to do? And although technically they're not in the Arctic Circle, they're close enough. Especially considering fishing is just another issue that causes friction between Arctic nations. So we thought you might appreciate listening to someone on the front line. Recently we've been running out farther and farther west to the Russian border to catch bigger and better apelio crab. But the problem with that is the seas get real rough, it's a long travel, and you can get yourself in trouble. If you cross over that line, you know, America can't really do much. The Russians are would be allowed to seize your vessel, take it into port, put you in jail. Earlier in our podcast, we mentioned that we'd be hearing from people with different perspectives about the Arctic. Well, Jake certainly has a unique take about melting sea ice. Well, honestly, if you ask me how it's affecting my livelihood, it is it's making my life a lot safer and easier because I'm not dealing with the ice that's normally coming down where each piece of ice is the size of a, a freight train or a school bus compacted together that will crush a 110 foot, 120 foot steel boat with a half inch plate steel into a pop can crushed. The money makers are the crabs. So we asked Jake if the changing climate made a difference in his ability to not only catch, but cash in on this most valuable commodity. The winters are getting warmer. That means the water temperatures are getting warmer. Right now, the temperature of the outside water is 62 degrees. I'm looking at it right now through my monitors. Now, when I'm fishing king crab, king crab are very, very fragile, and they only like a certain temperature of water, just like people that live in California. They don't want to live in the rain. So if you think about it like that, this is how you have to find them. And if you're in too warm a water, they don't, they don't live in there. And they also will not survive in too warm of water. So when you put them into your crab boat, you are now pulling water that's coming off the top, which is warmer than the water that they live in on the bottom. And they will not last for your typical two weeks like they used to. I fish for four days and I go in dock to dock. Otherwise, my crab will die, and each crab's worth anywhere from sixty to a hundred dollars. I have about twenty-five thousand to fifty thousand king crab that I have to catch, so you don't want to kill them. So that part of my life, the climate change has made it very difficult because I have to spend a lot of money on fuel, running crab loads in and out. We hope you came away from this podcast with an increased awareness of the complexities and issues facing the United States in the Arctic and how they are intertwined with the Defense Intelligence Agency's mission of our nation's security. Before we go, here's one more trip around the room to hear some closing thoughts from our guests. First up is Phil Thorne with the United States Coast Guard. Well, certainly like everywhere in the country and around the world, You know, the COVID-19 pandemic has affected the Coast Guard, the way the Coast Guard operates on the water everywhere in the country, including in the U.S. Arctic. You know, there's been a history and legacy of visitors bringing disease to the remote towns and villages in Alaska. So the first thing that we do is we've prioritized our work and we simply defer missions that we don't have to do. And when we must travel, you know, to the U.S. Arctic locations, Uh, We have developed a rigorous, a very rigorous 
testing and quarantine regime for our people before they depart so that we can minimize any chance that we would um, be a part of the problem and bring the virus to those locations. Author of All Hell Breaking Loose, Michael Clare. As friction between the U.S. and Russia and friction between the U.S. and China increases over other issues, not related to the Arctic specifically, but over other issues, that that could spill over into the Arctic. I think if you could separate the Arctic from those other conflicts occurring elsewhere, I do believe that that friction in the Arctic per se can be resolved peacefully. Crab fishing boat captain Jake Anderson. I would say if you ever get a chance to go to Alaska, don't pass it up, especially in the summer. It's beautiful, absolutely beautiful. The wildlife is abundant. I saw a bear yesterday and her cub. There's killer whales here, humpback whales here, all kinds of porpoises. It's, it's truly a beautiful place and it should be visited and, and kept sacred. From the Arctic Domain Awareness Center, Randy Key. The Arctic is teeming with life. It is a pristine wonder of our planet. And frankly, we need as a nation to devote time and energy to better secure this region aligned to our interests and in concert with the interests of our allies and partners. We need to start catching up. We'll give the final word to former Defense Intelligence Agency Intelligence Officer Jim Denoy. I really believe that if we're going to have a, a comprehensive Arctic strategy in the interest of the United States, it must uh, involve a deep partnership and cooperation with Canada, particularly to deal with what Russia is doing in the Arctic and what China potentially can do over the coming years. A big thank you to all of our guests who shared their thoughts and concerns about the Arctic. If you want to learn more about the Defense Intelligence Agency, both past and present, check us out on our social media pages and on DIA.mil. Thanks for listening to DIA Connections. 